Hello everyone, welcome back to our MOOC course on the topic of fundamentals of nuclear power generation and uh, today we are going to start our fourth module which is on chain reactions in reactors. As uh, you can remember in the previous module we discussed about the fission reactions which is uh, from power generation point of view probably the most important interaction that we can have between a neutron and nucleus and uh, whenever a nucleus is absorbing one neutron then uh, it can lead to either a non-fission capture or a fission reactions and uh, according to their probability we generally classify uh, materials into different categories. The one of our interest is the fissile materials which can absorb a thermal neutron and can go for a fission. But uh, if you remember the definition of uh, fissile material actually just uh, getting fission by uh, thermal neutron was not the only criteria rather the definition of fissile material uh, requires two criteria to be satisfied. The first is it can uh, or it should undergo fission reaction after absorbing a thermal neutron, but the second one is that it should also sustain a chain reaction. That means, after absorbing one neutron it undergoes a fission and uh, after absorbing a thermal neutron that is it can undergo fission, but if nothing happens afterwards then also you should not call that a fissile material. Like uh, fertile materials are those which uh, does not satisfy either of the criterion like it cannot undergo fission through the it cannot undergo fission by absorbing thermal neutrons generally and even if it can undergo fission by absorbing a thermal neutron. Uh, it cannot sustain a chain reaction following that. That means, once one reaction is done that is it nothing happens afterwards. So, the chain reaction is a very important one to have from reactor point of view uh, that which of course, uh, as the term suggests and I think uh, most of you have the idea it is quite analogous to the chemical chain reaction that we can have. Chain reaction refers to the uh, continuous fission reaction that is once uh, suppose you have some quantity of fuel you have several fissile material nuclei given to you. Now, you uh, have a beam of neutron say thermal neutrons and you strike the nucleus with that neutron. Now, once a neutron uh, is captured by a nucleus and it undergoes a fission reaction then uh, that fission reaction is uh, associated with the parent nucleus being splitted into two daughters and also you will always find that it is emitting neutrons. The number of neutrons emitted during a fission reaction can vary it can be anything between 1 to 7, but most commonly it is 2 or 3. Now, those 2 or 3 neutrons that has been released by the fission reaction if they are given proper condition then they can also strike another nucleus and uh, that nucleus can also undergo a fission reaction that is what we call as chain reaction just like shown in this diagram. Like to start with here one uranium 235 isotope is being struck by this particular neutron which is a thermal neutron let us assume this to be a thermal neutron. Now, uranium 235 is has a very high uh, fission cross section when it is subjected to thermal neutrons. So, accordingly it is very likely to undergo fission by producing two isotopes two daughter isotopes that is and uh, they are generally krypton or barium or it can be anything else, but our interest here is this three neutrons which has just got produced because of this fission. These three neutrons if we can allow proper condition to them they should also strike three different nucleus and each of those nucleus will again produce uh, their common daughters or their daughters and each subsequent reaction that way are again likely to produce two or three more neutrons. That means, just in uh, two steps you can see here we have started with just a single neutron and after two steps here we are having 9 neutrons to deal with and these 9 neutrons again are likely to strike 9 more nucleus and those nucleus again will undergo fission reaction to produce 9 into 3 that is 27 neutrons. This is what we call a chain reaction. However, this is a very very ideal diagram that is shown to you because uh, the nuclear neutrons that has been emitted or produced by a fission reaction it is not that all of them will induce fission to some uh, subsequent nucleus. Some of them will do some of them will not it is also possible that none of them also undergo uh, none of them are able to induce any kind of fission reaction because 
after getting emitted from this fission reaction here and before striking the nucleus here in between this portion the neutron can undergo several phenomenon which we shall of course be discussing uh, in uh, later uh, sections or later part of this lecture itself um, but uh, probably one you can immediately recognize at this moment the neutrons which are being produced by the fission neutron reaction here that is uh, this neutrons that we are talking about they are in inevitably they are fast neutrons okay and uh, here i would like to also mention neutrons depending upon when they are getting produced we can classify into two categories one is prompt neutron which refers to this particular neutrons which are direct product of a fission reaction and they are generally released within 10 to the power minus 14 seconds of fission occurrence basically that is the time scale 10 to the power minus 14 second which is associated with the fission reaction and so these neutrons these prompt neutrons they are immediately available as soon as we have a fission reaction but there can be some further neutrons that can come later on into the sequence like here the products of fission that you can see after this first step of fission reaction you have this krypton 91 and barium 142 as the products as per this diagram generally both of them are radioactive and they will undergo some more fissions uh, and uh, accordingly they will produce uh, i am sorry they will not undergo fission rather they will go through radioactive decay of their own uh, forming their own uh, radioactive chains till the formation or appearance of some kind of stable nucleus now uh, during the radioactive decay of this fission fragments we can also have some further neutrons produced and those neutrons are called delayed neutrons. It is not that every fission fragment decay will uh, lead to the formation of uh, delayed neutrons, but some of the fission fragments may be quite rich in terms of neutron and they can emit neutrons. So, corresponding uh, fission fragments which are uh, neutron rich and uh, therefore, are capable of emitting neutrons are called delayed neutron precursors. We shall be discussing about that in later chapter. Uh, but uh, the neutrons which are emitted accordingly they are delayed neutrons. Now, while prompt neutrons are emitted within 10 to the power minus 14 seconds of fission occurring when the delayed neutrons will be released that is uh, difficult to say because that depends upon the decay rate of this fission fragments that can be released immediately within maybe just a few nanoseconds or even less times or it may require uh, minutes or hours or sometimes even longer for these delayed neutrons to appear following any particular fission. Now, the prompt neutrons which are produced following the fission reactions or immediately after a fission reaction they are inevitably uh, very high energy neutrons because the prompt neutrons carry about 2 percent of the total energy, energy emitted during the fission reactions and uh, this energy they acquire in form of their own kinetic energy therefore, they are always ultra fast uh, velocity levels and they are having high amount of kinetic energy. But as we have seen in the previous module that the kinetic energy when kinetic energy of a neutron is high its absorption cross section is extremely low. It's, it must it must slow down so that it can reach to somewhere near the thermal neutron level so that it can attain some significant value of this absorption cross section or fission cross section so that uh, it can uh, induce fission to a nucleus that means this group of three neutrons which has just been produced following the uh, fission of the first uranium 235 nucleus they are prompt neutrons and therefore they are also fast neutrons that means they must undergo through the moderator through the moderation process where uh, because of repeated elastic scattering they can get thermalized and then only they will be able to uh, induce fission in this subsequent nucleus like here. And when it is undergoing uh, this uh, f um, moderation process it is uh, there is every possibility that they may get absorbed by the moderator itself or they may, they may get absorbed by some other elements that may be present inside the nucleus inside the nuclear reactor core. Generally a nuclear reactor core can have several kinds of elements some of them used for controlling the rate of reaction some of them just as the fission products like the fission products that are getting produced because of the radioactive decay of the fission fragments, some of them may also eat up some of the neutrons thereby the it is not that all these three neutrons produced here will be available to cause subsequent fission rather only some of them or uh, maybe a very very small number that may be available for a subsequent fission. 
that means chain reaction while while it may seem that it is a quite natural process but actually a nuclear reactor point of view chain reaction somehow we have to ensure the appearance of chain reactions because only because of the chain reaction we can sustain the energy production inside reactor rather if the chain reaction is not able to sustain then after passing this beam of neutron we can get one fission reaction done and we are able to harness corresponding energy but that's it if there is no for chain reaction then there is no further fission so no further energy release somehow we have to sustain this chain reaction and we have to sustain this chain reaction uh, by then what if we want to sustain the chain reaction then what we have to ensure we must ensure that these neutrons which are getting produced following a fission reaction at least some of them are capable of inducing fission to some other uh, fissile, fissile nuclei and uh, that is quantified in terms of something called an effective multiplication factor or just multiplication factor. In order to ensure a stable sustained chain reaction, we must have at least one may be more number of neutrons produced during a fission to and cause another fission, fission reaction. And accordingly this effective multiplication factor is defined as the ratio of number of neutrons which are produced from fission of one neutron generation divided by the number of neutrons absorbed and leaking in the preceding neutron generation. Neutron generation what it refers we shall be seeing shortly, but you can think about this like if we go back to the previous diagram. Here we have these three neutrons which are getting produced uh, from uh, one uh, fission and they are being first neutrons they are immediately absorbed by the reactor core absorbed or I should not use the term absorbed they are immediately available to the reactor core for any subsequent action which may be fission may be non fission capture may be just moderation etc or may be just leaking out of the core. So, these three neutrons that are available for the reactor to cause any subsequent steps and then uh, some of them uh, they will go through the moderation process they will go through different other activities and accordingly some of them will be kept enough will be able to induce some further fission and say out of this three only this one is capable of inducing fission other two are either getting absorbed in different steps of the moderation process or leaking out of this. So, the out of this three only one is capable of inducing another fission of this particular nucleus and because of that it is again producing three more neutrons. So, this is what is termed as one generation that is this is one generation uh, starting from here and that is finishing before the next set of neutron appears following a fission. Now, at the beginning of this generation we have these three neutrons available we have these three neutrons available for the reactor to act upon and at the end of the generation we, once this new generation starts that is also starting with these three neutrons or maybe some other number depending upon exactly how many number of uh, neutrons are participating in the subsequent fission. So, the ratio of the neutrons which are available in this generation and, and the neutrons which are available in this generation that is what we term as the effective multiplication factor. Uh, look at this diagram here horizontal axis refers to time and vertical axis represents this effective multiplication factor. Now, look at case A this one this refers to a situation when this effective multiplication factor is continuously increasing with time what does that refer that means the number of neutrons produced in the subsequent generation is more compared to the number of neutrons which are available to the previous generation like referring to the previous diagram again where three neutrons were available at the beginning of one generation and say if all three of them are capable of inducing fission then in the next step we shall be having nine neutrons available or at the beginning of the next generation we shall be having a nine neutrons available. So, corresponding effective multiplication factor we are getting to be equal to three and this situation is shown by this case A here that is the effective multiplication factor is greater than one and therefore, it keeps on increasing with time and hence the total number of neutrons that is available inside the reactor core that also keeps on increasing with time. Now, what does that imply? If the number of neutrons available inside a reactor core that keeps on increasing with time then uh, we can expect the rate of fission also to go up 
and hence that will keep on increasing the amount of energy released during fission. So, the implication of having an effective multiplication factor value uh, greater than 1 is that the rate of energy released with time keeps on increasing continuously. Look at case C now, it is the other extreme, here this effective multiplication factor is less than 1. That means, again referring to the previous example where 3 neutrons are available at the beginning of one generation and in the next generation say we have only 2 neutrons available. Then effective multiplication factor is 2 by 3 which is of course, uh, 0 0.67 that is less than 1. So, while 3 neutrons are available for uh, getting uh, captured or acted upon by the reactor in the next generation we have only 2 available. So, uh, we can always expect in the subsequent uh, generation the number of neutrons will be less than 2 because uh, there are much lesser uh, probability of any further fission happening and so the rate of fission reaction uh, keeps on coming down accordingly the rate of uh, energy release from the reactor also continues to come down. The third uh, case the case B shown in this diagram it is a very interesting one. Here the multiplication factor is equal to 1 and that is maintained constant with respect to time. Then what is the significance of this? It refers that whatever may be the number of neutron that is getting absorbed or that is available to a reactor at the beginning of a generation, at the beginning of the next generation we have exactly the same number of neutrons available. So, the total number of neutrons available inside the reactor that is being maintained constant over the over a long period of time and hence that implication has to be a constant rate of fission and hence a constant rate of energy release a very ideal situation. In terms of uh, reactor uh, nomenclature point of view this case B is called critical it is called a reactor has gone critical here uh, I am summarizing the three situations first is case A which is effective multiplication factor greater than 1 this refers to a supercritical state a supercritical reactor which refers to a continuous increase in the energy release. Case C is uh, the effective multiplication factor less than 1 which is referred to as a subcritical reactor and it is associated with a continuous decline in the energy release. And third case that is our case B is the critical state where we have a steady rate of energy release which is uh, an ideal situation which we generally would like to maintain in a commercial power plant, uh, commercial nuclear power plant that is. So, magnitude of multiplication factor in a reactor can be controlled by manipulating the values of different factors generally the rate of production, rate of absorption and also the leakage rate because we can always write the change in the number of neutrons or rate of change in the number of neutrons inside the reactor should be equal to the rate of production minus the rate of absorption minus the rate of leakage. Thereby balancing these three quantities we can maintain or we can maneuver the value of this effective multiplication factor inside the core. Now, uh, can you guess out of these three which is the most ideal situation that has to be k effective equal to 1 if we can maintain an effective multiplication factor equal to 1 that means we are in a steady state situation the number of neutrons is maintained constant uh, across all the generations and hence we are able to produce a fixed amount of power continuously over a time period time. But that does not mean that other two are not at all required like suppose uh, the system is producing a fixed amount of power now there is a sudden increase in the demand then we have to increase the rate of energy release then what we should like to do we would like to control the reactor such that the effective multiplication factor at least for some period of time becomes greater than 1 so that the rate of reactions and rate of energy release increases and once the rate of energy release matches the new demand then we can again uh, control the reactor related parameters such that this uh, situation reverts back from this k equal to 1 that is it is able to maintain this news at newly attained steady state. Then at what situation we may desire to be the k effective less than 1? Of course, uh, k effective less than 1 is the other situation when we have to reduce the energy production then we would like to reduce the effective multiplication factor by using some controls. So, that the rate of energy release decreases and once we are able to attain the reduced energy level then we can again uh, go back to this k effective equal to 1. 
there can be other situations also like you have to shut down a reactor a running reactor which is running for some period of time now you have to shut it down then you have to maintain this effective multiplication factor less than 1 so that the rate of energy is dies down and finally it becomes subcritical and finally uh, after some reasonable period of time the multiplication factor becomes 0 or almost equal to 0 and there is no further reaction inside. Similarly, just or I should say on the contrary, we would like to have this situation when you are starting a uh, fresh reactor or something that was shut down for quite some period of time. Here there was no generation to start with, we have to provide a higher effective multiplication factor so that the rate of reaction keeps on increasing, rate of energy release keeps on increasing till we attain some kind of rated capacity. So, uh, if you are asked about what is the most important parameter from reactor control point of view, you have to mention the name of this effective multiplication factor. Because just by controlling the value of this one, we can have a critical reactor, a subcritical reactor or a supercritical reactor and uh, we can control the rate of energy release. Of course, it is not that the controlling this effective multiplication factor is uh, just a very easy one. There are several factors associated with this, but it can be done. Also another interesting situation is presented when this supercritical reactor we are dealing with like this case A. You can clearly see the rate of energy release is continuously increasing. What that can uh, be synonymous to? That has to be a nuclear weapon or a nuclear bomb. A nuclear weapon is something where we do not have any control on the rate of reaction or we may have some control, but somehow we make it highly supercritical so that the rate of reaction keeps on increasing and it is able to in, uh, release large amount of energy within a very short duration time. Now, we come to something called a neutron life cycle. Life cycle deals with uh, the life history of a neutron or the events through which a neutron undergoes from the beginning of one generation to the uh, maybe you can say just before the beginning of the next generation that is what we refer to as a life cycle. Here we have n number of first neutrons available at the beginning of a life a generation. So, these neutrons may have been produced by a fission reaction or by some other means. So, they are always first neutrons. Then what they are most likely to undergo to start with? Of course, uh, first fission uh, pro uh, probability is uh, quite low or the fission cross section for common isotopes like erythrium 235 or 238 are very very low, but still small amount of first fission can always happen. And so, some amount some of these neutrons will participate in a first fission process thereby producing some more neutrons and adding that to this. And that is characterized by something called the first fission factor. This first fission factor refers to the ratio of the number of neutrons after the first fission divided by the number of neutrons before the first fission. Then the value of this first fission factor should be greater than 1 or less than 1? It has to be greater than 1 because whatever may be the number of neutrons initially available, total number will increase maybe by a very small fraction, but it will increase because of the neutrons, fresh neutrons which has been released during this first fission. So, at the end of this first fission process, you have n into epsilon number of neutrons available in the framework. Then some of these first neutrons may leak out through the reactor. So, uh, next factor that we have to introduce is called first fission or first non leakage probability or first neutron non leakage probability. Uh, remember the term here we are defining this as a non leakage probability. That means, we are trying to capture the number of neutrons which will survive this leakage of first neutrons. Then, how many neutrons will leak out from uh, as a first neutron level? Uh, and how many neutrons will survive? Of course, n into epsilon was the total number of neutrons available. This first neutron non leakage probability is defined as number of neutrons surviving this leakage divided by the total number of first neutrons available. So, number of neutrons surviving this uh, leakage has to be n epsilon into p f and n epsilon into 1 minus p f is the fraction that is leaking out from the reactor core as a first neutron or as first neutrons. What is the next step? These are being first neutrons, their uh, fission cross section generally is quite low like in case they can induce first fission, but their probability is very very small. So, they go through the moderation process. 
they go through during the moderation process their new energy keeps on coming down. Now, uh, I am just very uh, roughly drawing the curve that we have discussed earlier the energy level here and the absorption or capture cross section here. If you remember the curve for low energy we have a 1 by v region where the capture cross section continuously decreases for very high energy also we have a decreasing trend that is with increasing neutron energy the capture cross section or absorption cross section comes down, but in between we have a resonance region. In this resonance region you can see lots of peaks something like this uh, that is at certain values of this energy the absorption cross section can be extremely high. These are of course, non fission capture that is absorbing this neutrons the corresponding element will only uh, create another new isotope of its own and may, may release a large amount of gamma radiation. So, uh, particularly uranium being the most common fuel uh, we generally use uranium 235 and 238 as a mixture in a reactor in a thermal reactor. Now, uranium 235 uh, has a very high thermal fission cross section, but generally a very low fast fission cross section. Whereas, uranium 238 is a fertile material that means, it requires only fast neutrons to cause any kind of reaction. Therefore, in this fast fission stage both uranium 235 and 238 can participate or rather any fissionable material can participate, but generally the cross section is very low. Therefore, this epsilon is greater than 1, but just only greater than 1. And when it is undergoing this resonance situation now, the it is every there is a large possibility that some of them may get absorbed or may get captured during this resonance peaks. Particularly uh, as was shown in the previous module res uranium 238 has very high resonance absorption cross section. There some of their peaks can be 100 or maybe 1000 times larger compared to the base values. So, this resonance absorption is something which will consume a good amount of this first neutrons which is n epsilon p f and which is while it is passing through this moderator and also the fuel. So, accordingly we define something called the resonance escape probability. Resonance escape probability is defined as the amount of neutrons which are able to survive across the resonance divided by total number of neutrons which are coming uh, um, to get moderated in the form of first neutrons. So, the number of neutron coming is uh, this one only and uh, the ratio of number of neutrons available after the resonance section divided by the neutrons available before this is called this is uh, called the resonance escape probability. The value of this resonance escape probability is strongly depend upon the percentage of uranium 238 which is which can be present there and also may depend upon the moderator. Now, this uh, if the resonance escape probability is defined by small p then how can you compute, compute the total number of neutrons available after this resonance absorption? n epsilon into p f was the number of neutrons available before this if we multiply this with small p which is this resonance escape probability we have the number of neutrons available after resonance and what should be the nature of them? They has to be thermal neutrons because uh, this resonance absorption happens when its energy is coming down through that intermediate level. And number of neutrons which are getting absorbed uh, during resonance absorption that has to be n epsilon p f into 1 minus small p. This is the number of neutrons which are getting absorbed during resonance and n epsilon p f into small p is the number of neutrons which are available at the end of resonance. And uh, as they have passed through the resonance region, so they must be thermal neutron. So, we have now thermal neutrons available after this uh, resonance absorption step is over. And now, once this resonance absorption is done, we have this n epsilon p f into small p number of uh, thermal neutrons available, which are ready to get absorbed by the fuel. But before that, some of the thermal neutrons can also leak out of the reactor similar to the first neutron. And accordingly, we can define a thermal neutron non leakage probability or just thermal non leakage probability. This uh, thermal non leakage probability refers to the number of neutrons which are able to survive this leakage, that is, number of neutrons available here 
divided by the number of neutrons available after the resonance absorption zone is done. So, it is basically the ratio of the number of neutrons at this particular point and number of neutrons available at this particular point. Then how many neutrons will be available after this thermal neutron leakage is done? We have n epsilon pf into small p number of neutrons available as a thermal neutron. So, out of that a portion will get leak out that portion is into 1 minus p t because we have defined here as non leakage probability quite similar to the first neutrons and hence total number of neutrons available here available after this uh, leakage is this. Now, these thermal neutrons of course, they also have to get absorbed uh, in the reactor core they being oh sorry I should have kept this one maybe let me keep this. Now, this uh, thermal neutron will get absorbed in the fuel, but along with fuel there can be some other kind of materials also like uh, we can uh, some examples will be given later on, but along with fuel inside the reactor core we may have certain other materials also which again can participate or contribute in a non fission capture kind of reaction that is characterized by this thermal utilization factor. Thermal utilization factor refers to the number of neutrons available. Uh, number of neutrons absorbed by the fuel divided by the total number of neutrons absorbed in the core. Uh, remember thermal utilization factor is number of neutrons absorbed in the fuel divided by total number of neutrons absorbed in the core. So, in the core fuel itself is present, but there can be other uh, components also like the moderator and a few examples I shall be giving shortly. So, number of uh, neutrons that are being absorbed in the fuel thermal neutrons that is that should be n epsilon p f small p into p t into this f these are the number of neutrons that has been captured by the fuel and number of neutrons that has been absorbed by other materials like moderator etcetera that is the 1 minus f fraction of whatever is coming in. So, now this is the number which has got absorbed in the fuel. So, they will uh, participate in the reaction and some of them of course, will get captured uh, some of them may undergo a fission re non fission capture reaction like whatever may get captured in the you if you think about the earlier examples that are given uranium 235 whenever it captures a neutron there is 85 percent probability of having a fission reaction, but there is also 15 percent probability of having a non fission capture. So, it is not that this exactly this number of fission reactions we are going to have rather we are going to have only a percentage of that like maybe 85 percent of this uh, in case of uranium 235 and each fission reaction will produce a variable number of neutrons which can also range between 1 to 7, but on an average between 2 to 3 and finally, after the fission is done here again we are going to get back a good number of first neutrons, first neutrons because these neutrons which will be appearing here they are all products of this new fission and it is characterized by this thermal fission factor also called neutron reproduction factor or thermal reproduction factor. It is the ratio of first neutrons produced by fission here and the number of thermal neutrons that is absorbed by the fuel that is this quantity. So, the total thermal fission factor or how many neutrons will be available after this? This is the number of neutrons that has got absorbed. So, total number of neutrons which will be available here these are the number of neutrons that has got absorbed in the fuel and eta fraction of that will be ok. Let me write it properly eta is the fraction of total number of neutrons that will get produced with this. So, these are the number of neutrons which will be available at the end of this generation and at the beginning of the new generation. This completes one neutron life cycle and uh, now if we want to calculate or define the effective multiplication factor here in terms of uh, this 6 terminologies or 6 definitions that we have provided. Then effective multiplication factor of course, the number of neutrons available at the beginning of a generation divided by the number of neutrons available at the beginning of the previous generation. So, at the beginning of this new generation these are the number of neutrons available which is in the numerator and 
at the beginning of the this previous generation these are the number of neutrons that was available which we have in the denominator. So, accordingly we get this effective multiplication factor as the product of all these 6 and quite occasionally these 2 non leakage probabilities are coupled into 1 capital P which is the product of this first non leakage probability and the thermal non leakage probability. So, this 6 factors or generally 4 factors associated with the reactor characteristics and or uh, the fuel and other characteristics plus 2 leakage non leakage probabilities to leakage related characteristics their product defines the effective multiplication factor. A simplified or idealized version of this can be defined for an infinite reactor. Infinite reactor means something that does not have any leakage. It is infinite size and therefore, there is no neighbor and nowhere for the neutron to leak through. So, what should be this non leakage probability for a, an infinite reactor? It has to be 1 because there is no leakage. So, accordingly the effective multiplication factor in that case we substitute this suffix if epsilon as this infinite. Uh, it is just a product of these 4 factors that is first fission factor epsilon, the uh, resonance escape probability small p, the thermal utilization factor small f and finally, thermal fission factor eta. This uh, infinite it is called the infinite multiplication factor it is found to be the product of these factors uh, 4 factors and accordingly it is very popularly known as this 4 factor formula. Quite occasionally this particular one is a term is a 6 factor formula, but that is a less used terminology, but this 4 factor formula is a classical term that we use to characterize any neutron life cycle and also the characteristics of a nuclear reactor in general. Another term very popularly used that is reactivity denoted by the symbol rho and it is defined as the k effective minus 1 by k effective. So, uh, why 1 here can you guess uh, effective multiplication factor equal to 1 what should be the value of this reactivity for a critical reactor? We know that a critical reactor refers to something where the rate of power generation is constant because effective multiplication factor is equal to 1. So, for a critical reactor effective multiplication factor has to be 1 and hence the value of reactivity equal to 0. Whereas, for a supercritical reactor k effective is greater than 1. So, reactivity is greater than 0. For a subcritical reactor effective multiplication factor is less than 1. So, reactivity is less than 0. And so, we can uh, visualize the rate of reaction or the nature of the uh, reaction that is going on inside a nuclear reactor in terms of either the multiplication factor or the reactivity. Here we have an example, okay, but before going to the example out of this let us forget the non leakage probabilities for them. Okay, uh, let us keep them in picture also. Uh, out of the 6 factors can you say which one will be greater than 1 and which one will be less than 1? What about the first fission factor? Because of the first fission total number of neutrons in the reactor that should increase because say we have 100 neutrons present here this small n equal to 100. Out of that maybe just one or two are participating in the first fission, but every such first fission will lead to new 2 or 3 neutrons getting added to this. So, total number of neutrons has to increase and therefore, this first fission factor is greater than 1. What about thermal fission factor? Quite similarly it is also greater than 1. Of course, uh, we know that a part of the number of neutrons that is getting absorbed in fuel will participate in non fission capture, but uh, generally that fraction is quite low uh, and uh, um, every fission reaction will produce a large number of neutrons. So, generally this thermal fission factor is also greater than 1, generally much higher than 1 depending upon the composition of the fuel. What about the others? What about the two non leakage probabilities? Uh, they are being non leakage probabilities they always refer to the number of neutrons which are surviving the leakage. So, both the non leakage probabilities has to be less than 1. What about the resonance escape probability? That is the ratio of number of neutrons surviving the resonance absorption divided by the number of neutrons absorbed or available for resonance absorption. So, that is also less than 1. And finally, the thermal utilization factor is the ratio of number of neutrons absorbed in fuel and number of neutrons absorbed in the core that is in fuel moderator plus everything else. So, that also has to be less than 1. 
So, out of the 6 factors 4 of them are less than 1, but the 2 fission factors are greater than 1. Here is one example. Here we are having small n equal to 1000, we are starting with 1000 neutrons and first we are having a first fission of 1.03. So, after the first fission is done, we are having 1030 number of neutrons available. These neutrons will go through the leakage phenomenon. 30 neutrons are getting generated because of first fusion, first neutron fission, and so 1030 number of uh, neutrons are available. Now, uh, let us uh, take a non-leakage probability of 0.95. So, uh, 95 percent of this 1030 will survive this, but 5 percent will leak out, and that 5 percent is 51. And after surviving this, we have 979 number of first neutrons that are available for moderation. So, this 979 number of uh, neutrons go through the moderation process during which they encounter the resonance absorption. We have a resonance scale probability of 0.75, then number of neutrons available after the resonance or number of neutrons which are able to thermalized will be 75 percent of whatever we started with and we started with this uh, 979. So, once this resonance absorption step is over, we are having 734 number of thermal neutrons available. These thermal neutrons, some of them may leak out. Again, we are having a leakage, non leakage probability of 0 0.96. So, 4 percent of the 734 that are leaking out, which are 29 neutrons, and 705 number of neutrons are available for uh, participating in the fission or any other no thermal capture. So, now we have a thermal utilization factor of 0.7, that means 30 percent of the 705 neutrons are getting absorbed in the moderator and other elements inside the reactor, but 70 percent are getting absorbed in the fuel. So, 70 percent of this 705 which is 495 that is getting captured in the fuel. Now, here we have a typical reproduction factor or thermal fission factor of 2.02, uh, which uh, generally corresponds to uh, capture to fission ratio 0 0.169. This diagram actually is shown for uranium 235. Uh, you may not be remembering, but uh, if you can go back to our previous uh, the slides for the previous module, there it was mentioned that uh, for thermal neutrons uranium 235 has a fission capture fission cross section of around uh, 580 something and capture cross section of around 100 or rather uh, 85 percent probability of fission and 15 percent probability of capture and correspondingly we get a capture to fission ratio 0 0.169 that is uh, about uh, that is uh, basically the ratio of this fission and capture cross section or this or not fission capture rather using fission and capture cross section we can calculate this number. And each fission reaction is producing uh, on an average 2.43 number of neutrons. So, we are getting a reproduction factor of 2.02 and hence uh, we need total number of neutrons available after this thermal fission is done that will be equal to the number of neutrons absorbed in fuel that is 495 multiply by the thermal fission factor or reproduction factor that is 2.02 which is approximately 1000. So, we started with 1000 number of neutrons and we have finished up at, uh, or we have reached another generation with again 1000 neutrons. Then what is the multiplication factor here? Here the effective multiplication factor is number of neutrons at the beginning of this new generation divided by the number of neutrons available at the beginning of the previous generation. Here both are equal and hence the effective multiplication factor is equal to 1. That means, here the all the numbers that are given for these factors they all corresponds to a critical reactor. That is uh, not very easy rather several factors that need to be adjusted to get a reactor in the, into the critical condition and the minimum mass of any fissile material that is required to have a sustained chain reaction that is to attain this reactivity of 0 or multiplication factor of 1 is called critical mass. Like for uranium 235 the critical mass is something around of the order of 51 kg something it is a very rough information just to give you some idea. If the total mass of the fuel is less than this critical mass then the reactor will become subcritical if it is uh, much higher than this critical mass, then it will become supercritical. So, balancing the critical mass or the value of the critical mass depends on all these factors. We have to see how we can control all these factors. 
first let us discuss about the leakage any leakage means the neutrons are going out of the system and so they are loss reflectors are the elements which are used to reduce the neutron leakage or just as the name suggests to reflect the neutrons back into the reactor core <coughs> so what should be the properties of a reflector reflector should be material which has a high scattering cross section and also very low absorption cross section because if the reflector starts to absorb uh, neutrons on their own then definitely uh, that will lead to a net loss rather they should primarily focus on scattering the neutrons back into the reactor core and therefore reflectors are the materials which are having high scattering cross section but low absorption cross section now uh, does this sound familiar because in the last module we have discussed about the moderator which are also likely to have similar properties high absorption cross sorry high scattering cross section and low absorption cross section therefore any good moderator material can also act as reflectors like uh, uh, use of uh, a, like it was mentioned water normal water is a very good moderator because it has a very high scattering cross section and reasonably low absorption cross section so moderator is a, the water can itself act as both moderator and reflector like it is quite common for boiling water reactors to immerse the entire core into a pool of water so that <coughs> neutrons will not be able to uh, come out of the reactor or whenever it is trying to coming out trying to come out it will get reflected back by the moderating element of the reflector which is water in that case now reflector offers several advantages firstly it reduces the neutron leakage making more neutrons available for the chain reaction and as more neutrons are available for chain reaction so the total rate of reaction that keeps on increasing and hence that reduces the total fuel requirement hence it corresponds to a lower critical mass or it minimizes the critical mass it also another advantage uh, i would not like to describe the details of that but it flattens the neutron flux distribution inside the core normally in a reactor core you will get this kind of hum kind of profile that is reactor uh, neutron density is high at the center and quite low at the edges because from the sides they will uh, neutrons will keep on leaking outside if we use the reflector then those neutrons will be reflected back and accordingly we get more or less an uniform kind of profile like uh, shown by the dotted line here we get quite uniform profile of neutron uh, and hence that as the rate of fission reaction of course depends upon the neutron density here like if the neutron density or neutron distribution is more here there is more likely to have fission reaction and hence higher energy release so the flatter profile of this neutron flux distribution reduces the non uniformity of power generation and also it utilize helps in utilizing the peripheral fuel assemblies like the fuel assemblies if we allow uh, this uh, hum kind of profile then the fuel assemblies which are mounted somewhere here they will receive very low amount of neutrons to have any kind of interaction and hence they will not get utilized properly therefore uh, the use of reflectors helps utilization of this peripheral assemblies as well now we have to discuss about all these four factors first is the thermal fission factor thermal fission factor as has already been defined is equal to the number of fast neutrons produced by thermal fission divided by the number of thermal neutrons absorbed in the fuel itself so mathematically we can say uh, in the denominator it is the scattering it is the absorption cross section of the fuel total absorption or macroscopic absorption cross section of the fuel which is fission plus capture because uh, once the neutron gets absorbed in a fuel it can participate either in fission reaction or capture reaction so corresponding macroscopic cross sections can be added together to get the denominator in the numerator we have the macroscopic fission cross section multiplied by this new this new uh, indicates the average number of neutrons produced per fission and hence uh, this uh, ratio or, or or this thermal fission factor can be defined by this particular ratio like uh, commonly we have uranium as the fuel in thermal reactors which comprises of uh, several isotopes primarily uranium 238 which is uh, more than 99 percent in case of natural uranium some quantity like in 0.7 percent in natural uranium is uranium 235 and we can also have small quantity of uranium 234 or 232 etc so absorption characteristics of all this need to be taken into consideration and uh, calculation of this thermal fission factor 
then it should be uh, if we neglect the other isotopes let us just consider around 238 and 235 then in the denominator it should be the uh, total absorption cross section of uranium 238 plus total absorption cross section of uranium 235. Uranium 235 for thermal neutrons has both fission and capture cross section, but uranium 238 its fission cross section can be neglected. So, what we have in the denominator this is the capture cross section macroscopic capture cross section of uranium 238 and macroscopic capture plus fission cross section of uranium 235. Whereas, in the numerator it is the fission cross section of uranium 235 multiplied by the nu for uranium 235. Uranium 238 does not participate in thermal fission because it is a fertile material and hence in the numerator we have the fission cross section of uranium 235 only. If you are dealing with some kind of fuel which has two different fissile isotopes then of course, in the numerator you need to uh, take the summation of nu into the fission cross section for both those materials. And also remember that this uh, nu depends on the isotope here as the example concerns only one fissile isotope. So, I have not used any subscript, but suppose you are using a fuel which contains both uranium 235 and plutonium 239 then uh, their nu values will be different and accordingly you need to take the summation of nu into sigma f for both of them. Now, uh, macroscopic cross section uh, is the multiplication or is the product of uh, nuclear density into the microscopic cross section. So, accordingly we can express this and now dividing the equation by the n uh, nuclear density for uranium 235 we get this where this small e is nuclear density of uranium 235 divided by the total nuclear density which is called an enrichment factor like for natural uranium it is uh, about 0.7 percent because only 0.7 percent is the uranium 235. Uh, but higher the enrichment factor of course, more will be the value of this uh, thermal fission factor and accordingly we uh, can adopt some kind of mechanism of increasing the fissile isotope in the fuel. So, that we can get higher value of this thermal fission factor. This is a graph which uh, shows the variation of this thermal fission factor with the enrichment. Uh, this here um, it has been um, considered to be a mixture of uranium 235 and 238 and therefore, the standard values of uranium 235 fission and 238 cross sections were taken like uh, for uranium 235 this sigma f is approximately 579 burns or some um, literature suggests about 585 burns. This sigma c for this is approximately 101 burns and uh, sigma capture cross section for uranium 235 is uh, 2.72. So, if we and nu this uh, number of uh, average number of neutrons produced by fission of uranium 235 is approximately 2.42 this one. So, if we uh, put all these numbers here then we can of course, calculate the thermal fission factor for different values of E which is shown in this graph. You can uh, you can try this calculation on your own just uh, put the value of uh, put this numbers here and put different values of E to get the corresponding variation in this thermal fission factor. Like for uh, natural uranium the enrichment factor is just about 0.7. So, that should lie somewhere here somewhere here and you can see for this value is quite less than 1 whereas, the maximum value we are getting something around this 2 around uh, 10 beyond an enrichment level of 10 there is hardly any increase in the value of this enrichment factor or rather this thermal fission factor. So, it is not required also to enrich the uranium 235 percentage more than 10 and here we have a chart which you can use while doing this calculation for fission cross section values for the different isotopes of uranium 235 and 238 and if you other materials are given and also the prompt neutron values that is produced here. The first data corresponds to thermal neutrons, second corresponds to the first neutrons. Delayed neutrons we shall be coming back later on. Next we have the thermal utilization factor. Thermal utilization factor refers to the number of thermal neutrons absorbed in a nuclear fuel divided by the total number of neutrons absorbed in the core by fuel and all other materials absorbed. In all other materials we have to consider 
moderator and any other kind of material that can be present. Like numerator is the macroscopic absorption cross section for the fuel, in the denominator we can have several substances like this is of course, the fuel here this corresponds to the moderator and something else like C R can be control rods, B refers to the boric acid which is commonly present, both control rod and boric acid we shall be discussing about them uh, in the their role in the uh, in later module on reactor control, but they are inevitably present in any reactor. P refers to poison, some of the fission products can act as neutron poison, basically they just have very high absorption cross section and therefore, they can eat up lots of neutrons. So, they are often termed as poison and there can be some other materials also. This is how we define for a homogeneous reactor, but uh, when you are dealing with a heterogeneous reactor, actually homogeneous refers to a reactor where uh, in every part of the reactor we have the same composition of fuel and reactor fuel and moderator etcetera, but heterogeneous means there is a variation in the composition and uh, in so if like in some part we have only the fuel in some other part we have only the moderator accordingly uh, the neutron density also varies like if we are having a fuel in one part whatever may be the neutron flux there if we are having moderator in the other part then neutron flux will be much lower because corresponding cross sections also will be different. Uh, so, when you dealing with the uh, a heterogeneous reactor, we also have to take the reaction rate into consideration. That is, every terms need to be multiplied or every cross section values need to be multiplied with uh, I, which is the corresponding neutron flux or beam intensity and V that is the volume of the corresponding component and accordingly we get this particular definition. This factor can, uh, this is actually a factor which can directly be controlled in a reactor by the operator. Like say, uh, if uh, our objective is to increase the, in, if our objective is to increase the multiplication factor, then we have to increase the thermal utilization factor. So, accordingly we can control any of them. If we pick up say this particular one, control rods uh, are elements which can be inserted or moved away or taken away from the reactor and they are generally comprised of materials like boron or cadmium which have high absorption cross section. So, if we want to increase the utilization factor, then we can uh, take these control rods out a bit. So, their corresponding cross section values reduces and the value of utilization factor increases. If our objective is the opposite, then we can insert the control rods a bit more. So, that this particular quantity increases and accordingly the value of this utilization factor also so, uh, decreases and in multiplication factor decreases. The fuel to moderator or moderator to fuel ratio is also very important in determining this value. Like a graph is shown here, where we have moderator to fuel ratio on the horizontal axis and different others on the axis. Our interest is this particular graph. As the amount of moderator inside the reactor code that increases, uh, moderator has a significant contribution in the denominator here and accordingly the value of f continuously decreases. But generally for a certain ratio of this moderator to fuel, we get uh, multiplication factor equal to 1 which is shown here. Uh, if the multi amount of moderator is less than that, we call it under modulated, under moderated and that corresponds to a lower value of effective multiplication factor. Similarly, uh, if the amount of moderator is increased beyond level, again effective multiplication factor reduces. Actually, I should not say 1, this is something the optimum level that we get. So, any quantity moderator quantity less than that refers to under moderated, anything uh, greater than that refers to over moderated. Again, by uh, neglecting all other factor in the denominator of this particular equation, by considering only a mixture of fuel and moderator and taking suitable cross section values, you can always calculate this effect of moderator to fuel ratio just assume a homogeneous reactor. So, that this uh, I and V values goes off, you take uranium as the fuel uranium 235 plus 238 and you take any moderator say if you take H 2 O as the moderator, you already have the values of its absorption characteristics and cross section values. And so, uh, put the value of uh, corresponding cross sections into this particular reaction into this expression for F and you can always see how the ratio of moderator to fuel affects this uh, particular uh, k effective. Third is resonance escape probability. 
uh, it is something very difficult to predict, but uh, the definition is number of neutrons that can reach thermal energy level divided by the number of fast neutrons that start to slow down in the moderator. Resonance scale probability um, like here, um, these graphs already you have seen, but I am showing again for comparison purpose the uh, resonance region, resonance absorption region for uranium 238 and plutonium 240. You can see both of them have extremely high absorption cross section at certain energy levels. Like whereas, at certain energy levels their cross section levels is somewhere here of the order of 0.1 at certain levels that can be thousands also. And in most of the cases that is in the order of tens. So, at certain energy level the absorption cross section can have 100 to 1000 time increase. And hence there is a large probability of good number of neutrons this intermediate energy neutrons that can get captured. Generally for uranium 235 this resonance absorption zone uh, expands from something like 200 electron volt to something about uh, 1 electron volt. So, it's, which is a large energy band to have and uh, if uh, the resonance absorption of course, this value of this probability depends strongly on the reactor structure and orientation and geometry. But if it is not carefully designed, large number of neutrons may get absorbed here. It is quite difficult to predict. Uh, just assuming a reactor filled only with uranium, uranium 238 is the one which goes through uh, this resonance absorption because uranium 235 does not have any significant resonance absorption characteristics. Then I am not going to the detail of this calculation, it can be expressed in a form like this, where in the numerator we have. Uh, it is an exponential function here we have nuclear density of uranium 238 zeta bar and sigma s in the denominator are two combination values uh, zeta sigma s refers to the total scattering cross section actually it is quite confusing because the similar symbols we are using this one for summation and this one to represent the macroscopic cross section so this sigma s here refers to the n into sigma microscopic scattering cross section for all elements like it can be uranium 235 and 238 in uh, present example. And zeta bar is again an weighted average uh, logarithmic energy decrement which is defined like this again taking the contribution from all possible elements that can be present. Actually, the contributions in both sigma s and zeta bar can come, come from uranium 235, uranium 238, the moderator etcetera. And then we have an integrand here E thermal is the lowest energy level where it is trying to reach to if f is the first energy level from where it is starting. Like I have mentioned E thermal commonly is around 1 to 10 electron volt for uranium 238, E f is about 200 electron volt this uh, evaluation of this integral is extremely difficult and depends strongly on the special self shielding of fuel and moderator that is where moderator and fuel are kept separately or not accordingly its value depends. Uh, this is one empirical relation where this integrand can be expressed like this and uh, if we put it back then this is some kind of approximate relation we can get which we shall be using later on for solving numerical problems. And finally, the first fusion factor. Uh, in it can invariably be neglected for most of the thermal reactor because it represents the ratio of number of fast neutrons produced by fission at all energies divided by number of fast neutrons produced in thermal fission or number of neutrons available at the beginning of any generation. Uh, when the number, uh, uh, number of moderator nucleus is more like if you think about a homogeneous reactor every fuel nucleus is likely to be surrounded by moderator nucleus and hence uh, there is every chance that fast fission may not at all happen. Like when this uh, moderator to fuel ratio is more than 50, fast fission factor is nearly 1, it can invariably be neglected. But there are certain situations when it is less than 50 and we have to consider this factor again another empirical relation which can occasionally be used, which again depends on the fuel to moderator ratio to have and uranium 235 its fast fission can be negligible, uranium 238 is something which uh, can undergo fast fission and therefore, this ratio contains nuclear density of uranium 238 and the nuclear density of the moderator. So, these are the way we can calculate the four factors to compile the value of this infinite multiplication factor and reactivity of any reactor. Uh, today, I, I would like to keep it up to this 
in the next lecture to start with we shall be seeing a sample uh, numerical problem where we shall be calculating the values of all these factors for a real reactor situation and trying to get an idea about this multiplication factor. So, thanks for now.